Okay, welcome everybody. Great crowd. Really nice to see you. The Leo Panda School for Socialist Education has been established to honor Leo's legacy. Above all, his role as an educator and public intellectual. Leo used to invite his students, uh, his graduate students, his graduate class, to the Panish House for the final class of the term. And on the occasion of his very last class before retirement, I was also sitting in. After it was over and they had all left, Leo, glowing with pride at the quality of students he had nurtured and developed, and probably also from the scotch he had imbibed during the final class, turned to me and said, strange, but I never really appreciated how much I truly loved teaching. The school will, we intend, reflect that same love, the, the same love of and emphasis on education, integrated, as with Leo, into the struggle for socialism. We also hope it will tap into signs of a newly emerging curiosity about socialism. But though socialism seems in the air in a way it hasn't for some time, the truth is that if anything, this school is late in coming. We should have done it long ago. Uh, as you can see from the crowd here, uh, we actually uh, you know, were surprised at how much interest there was. In terms of the classes that we're going to start running a week Sunday, we were looking to have 15 to 20 people in the classes, and we were double that last week. We're also planning on adding a weekend school on organizing in the fall, and a number of other educational events and forums in the interim, and there's some people planning some uh, exciting social events, which I, cultural events, which I, I, I don't actually know the details of, but they seem great. We're also looking for donations to the school, uh, and you, you'll find those on the website, uh, which will also soon include an archive of Leo's key writings, uh, writings and speeches. Uh, so any help in recruiting others to the school as this proceeds, we really want this not to be a one-off event. We really want to institutionalize something uh, in the GTA you know, with wider implications. Brian Palmer. Brian Palmer is generally known as Canada's foremost labor historian, though his work extends far beyond labor itself. He's been criticized by some for coloring his analysis with his socialist politics, alleged, allegedly compromising his subjectivity, his, his uh, objectivity and rigor. Brian didn't win his critics over when he responded in characteristic fashion by suggesting that, and I'm quoting him, the persistent calls for rigor are often the first innocent signs of rigor mortis. <laughs> Brian has, in fact, always had the greatest respect for the most serious analysis. Like Leo, he is always committed to an intellectual practice based on, 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 on understanding that only the best analysis can contribute to the transformation of society. What he, like Leo, was dismissing was a kind of aggrandized theorizing that allowed little room for, and this is a quote from Brian, an understanding of past and present as part of a continuous and unfinished effort to resist, challenge, and change the limits within which men and women find themselves. We hope the Leo Panis School for Socialist Education lives and expands in that same spirit. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian. He'll speak for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have a reasonably short Q&A so that you can mix and we can get on with the social. Brian? Thank you, Sam, for that kind and generous introduction. I, I mean, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm going to try to avoid speaking directly into this mic to assail your, your senses, but I think if I stand like this, it should be okay for the, for the recording, et cetera. So thanks very much, Sam, for that generous, uh, kind introduction. It is really an honor uh, and a privilege to be here at the sort of inauguration of the Leo Panich uh, School for Socialist Education. I was going to bring a couple of posters as a kind of show and tell for the fact that Leo and I go back in many ways, often in conflictual ways, for well over 40 years um, to the Ottawa Committee of Labor Action, 
uh, and to when I taught at Simon Fraser in 1981, and I invited Leo to be part of a lecture series that we were doing there on, on the working class. But I thought a crowd like this is a bit too mature for show and tell, so I abstained <laughs> from, from that inclination. Um, I want to thank as well the organizers of this, Matt. I know uh, people like Greg Albo and others play, played a fundamental role, and I very much appreciate uh, uh, everything that's been done. And it's really wonderful to be uh, in Toronto in a crowd like this. Uh, I've seen many people that I haven't seen for a long time, and it's uh, a nice breakout uh, um, move. Okay, the talk that I'm going to give uh, tonight, uh, um, the past is before us, obviously, has uh, a particular set of meanings. Uh, and I'll be addressing uh, the history of capitalism, uh, colonialism, uh, and Canada in a very broad swath of time, from roughly 1500 to the present. So you're going to get a, a, a grand tour here. Uh, what I'm doing is paring down a manuscript that's about 1700 pages that I'm trying to uh, reduce to a publishable size, um, but I'm hoping to hit the high points. I will miss so much, but I have decided to focus almost explicitly in the discussion of colonialism on uh, indigenous peoples, rather than addressing, uh, which is in the larger manuscript, uh, Quebec, uh, and also Canada's uh, role as a, as a colonizing uh, power uh, in the developing world. So I'll be speaking then uh, very much uh, focusing on indigenous relations uh, within capitalism uh, and colonialism. In 1753, Voltaire offered a flippant and a well-known commentary on the origins of Canada. Two or three merchants from Normandy, on the slight hope of a small commerce of furs, equipped a few vessels and established a colony in Canada, a country covered with snows and ices eight months of the year, inhabited by barbarians, bears, and beavers. And so begins the capitalism-colonialism determination. In the age of empire's clash and the slave trade, the plantation economy of Guadeloupe was prized, the barren wilds of Canada despised. And I should, of course, note that when I use terms like barbarians, savages, sauvage, uh, primitive, etc., all of these are in quotation marks uh, and are part of uh, the way this was commonly described in sources at the time. They are not my language, but I am convey conveying to you a language of colonialism. A little more than a century later, the elite component of the white settlers about to establish Canada as a dominion nation state were far more upbeat in their assessment of the country's worth. George Brown, the editor of a newspaper destined to become Canada's most influential daily, The Globe, was bullish on Confederation's promise. If Canada acquires this territory, he said, as he glanced westward, it will rise in a few years from a, from a position of a small and weak province to be the greatest colony any country has ever possessed. So snows and ice and barbarians, too, melted into the dream of nation, albeit one conceived colonial. A century and a half again takes us to the summer of 2022. An apple, an like I get these, this apostolic apologetics. The Pope made a pilgrimage of penitence to three locations in Alberta, Quebec, and none of it. The apologetics centered on colonialism's responsibility and bad deeds, Catholic Catholicism's unworthy sinners, and the state's ultimate responsibility. No longer were the country's original inhabitants barbarians, they were now wrong peoples, many of whom survived the disciplines, punishments, and cultural genocide foisted on them by state institutions and policies. The Pope was particularly aghast that their spiritual beliefs had been assailed. The restitution, of course, that the church actually owed residential school survivors as a consequence of an earlier settlement that it had never honored went unmentioned essentially until after the Pope departed Canada. The colonialism-capitalism relation was not going to be addressed adequately uh, from a religious entity that is and has historically for centuries been one of the most powerful institutional players in land and finance in the global marketplace. I want to forego in a crowd like this uh, the simple definitions of capitalism and colonialism. I think everyone uh, kind of understands what uh, I would mean when I use those terms. And I want to, as I said, bypass uh, discussions of Quebec and foreign 
uh, colonial uh, interventions. What I want to do tonight is to introduce a broad periodization of capitalism, colonialism, uh, and indigeneity. Looking at first the 1500 to 1790 years, a period I'll call capital cravings and the coming of colonialism. The 1790 to 1890 years of capitalism's consolidation and colonialism's constrictions. The 1890 to 1960 period of capitalism ascendant, colonialism extended, and resistance restrained. And the 1960 to 2023 period, anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, and capitalist crisis. Within all of this, what I think it's worth stressing is that capitalism, like colonialism, shifts within distinct periods of differentiated development. But over time, the argument that I will be making uh, is that they have become so intertwined as to be virtually indistinguishable. Capitalism and colonialism combine to produce the hegemonic hold of an ethos of possessive, acquisitive individualism, a process in which state formation figured forcefully and the accumulation of profit was fundamental. This differed greatly from a diverse indigenous experience and in this talk tonight I'm going to gloss over the many many differentiations among indigenous peoples to put forward a more generalized uh, understanding of indigeneity. Indigenous peoples operated as Lewis Henry Morgan noted in the mid-19th century in fundamentally different ways than those associated with the profit system of mercantile and then industrial capital. For First Nations, the public domain constituted what Morgan and subsequently Marx and Engels designated a primitive communism in which practices of hospitality were generally present. This was recognized by European interlopers and colonizers who early came to the conclusion that indigenous peoples of the North American continent, unlike themselves, held all things in common. Introduced to the Parisian French court in 1649, two savage Indians were shocked that grown men would prostrate themselves before a child king, Louis XIV. They were aghast that the city exhibited such disarmingly contrasting displays of wealth and poverty, since in their primitive understandings, all were equalized in the balance of nature, and not one should be exalted above another. And when these observations were reported in England, an editor denounced the indigenous men as two heathen levelers. Capitalism, colonialism versus the commons. Counterposed material orderings of everyday life. So let me start then with the 1500 to 1790 period. Capital cravings and the coming of colonialism. Colonialism did not come from nothing. It grew out of the disillusion of feudal Europe, the competitive scramble for empire's mercantilist accumulations, the crises of absolute estates, bourgeois challenges to aristocratic authority, and the increasing, increasing sway of market societies and their nation class formations all contributed and figured in this historical development. The so-called new world's riches of gold and silver beckoned, the mercantilist natural law of the political economy of the time, dictating that the resources that might accrue to one, any one single empire were finite, were finite and needed to be battled for against rival imperial projects, as well, of course, as the pagan occupants of territory supposedly untouched by the spirit of development. Such lands were in the convenient doctrine of discovery judged terra nullius, right to be overtaken. The craving then at the beginning was not so much for colonies as for capital, but one could not be had without the other. Beaver pelts became a critical commodity fueling that drive to accumulation. A Montagnet hunter told a Jesuit in 1634, the beaver does everything perfectly well. It makes kettles, hatchets, swords, knives, bread. In short, it makes everything. Trade became the endeavor that planted the authority of monopolistic, if feudally orchestrated, capital on the land, waterways, and seascapes of what would become British North America a vast expanse of indigenous inhabitation administered by chartered companies. The most celebrated Canadian example, the Hudson's Bay Company, bridged the transition from feudalism to capitalism in the old world and extracted from the so-called new in excess of 20 million pounds 
over the course of the 1670 to 1857 years. This fur trade profit became part of the accumulative foundation on which factories, mills, and mines rested, both in Britain and in its colonial possessions. Now let me situate this vast history of roughly three centuries within the three R's, reciprocity, reality, and royal proclamation. First, reciprocity. Wars of European empires and the fur trade harvesting that defined much of this early uh, capitalist colonial relation both demanded a certain reciprocity of colonizers and indigenous peoples. As early as 1664, it was recognized that the trade for beaver and other peltry must be carried on chiefly by means of gunpowder. The violence associated with, mercantile, with the mercantile era's craving for capital did not deter Harold Adams Innes from a rather startlingly benign construction of the legacies of indigenous European relations. Canada, he wrote, has no serious problems with her native peoples since the fur trade depended primarily on these races. So that's one kind of strange reading of reciprocity. But secondly, reality was rather different. For if the beaver made goods valued by First Nations peoples, it also made much else. Cheap brandy, wine, and rum with the debilitating consequences of such spirits, devastating diseases that decimated First Nations populations, the sign of the cross that went hand in hand with capital accumulation and carried uh, by Jesuits and others unleashed a profound and disorienting train of uncertainty and psychological dislocation among indigenous peoples. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the wars and conquests that pitted Europeans' empires against one another and inevitably drew First Nations into their escalating violence. Third was the Royal Proclamation of 1763. It illustrated much of the ideological uh, um, mindset of empire's uh, evolving perspective. The 18th century wars were winding down with the victory of the British over the French in 1760, and the Royal Proclamation that resulted has been interpreted, often by indigenous peoples themselves, as a Magna Carta of Indian rights. It explicitly designated the huge North American regions as traditional land and established that such Indian territory could not be alienated in market transactions without approval of the British Crown. It was thus an early statement that the founding of Canada was a merger of three peoples, First Nations, British, and French, something rarely acknowledged in later colonial and state decrees. But the entire premise of the Royal Proclamation was that Indian territory was indeed subject to the age-old doctrine of discovery. So-called traditional lands came under British sovereignty as a consequence of the conquest of New France in 1760. The land was, before empire's various intrusions, terra The 1763 royal edict laid the cornerstones for the subsequent claim that 89% of the land in Canada belonged to the Crown, an entity that was not required to negotiate with anyone over anything. This prefaces uh, many of the numbered treaties of the, of the post-Confederation years, and as the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick would soon learn as early as the 1780s, their traditional lands began to disappear. New, um, in New Brunswick, the Elsipatog First Nations saw their traditional territory shrink from 4 million hectares of Acadia and beyond to 51,200 acres in 1800 to the roughly 2,000 acres on which they now live. The British appropriated vast tracts of lands bordering uh, the Great Lakes from the Mississauga over the course of the 1780s. The phrases outlining the purchase of these, uh, of these lands were characteristically vague. Gunshot treaties, for instance, as they were known, addressed all territory within earshot of a musket's retort. A chief later lamented that there was precious little, little comfort under the compensatory tent of the royal proclamations. You came as a wind blown across the Great Lakes, he said. The wind wafted you to our shores, he told British redcoats and their upper Canadian officials. We received you, we planted you, we nursed you. We protected you till you became a mighty tree. 
that spread through our hunting land. With its branches, you now lash us. Hospitality's thanks were few indeed. In 1913, Duncan Campbell Scott published a list of 20 so-called land surrenders in Upper Canada that followed immediately on the creation of the province and totaled 17 million acres. Compensation for this territory ranged from a low of 10 shillings to a high of 4,000 pounds, the latter almost always paid out in supplies and sometimes doled out over the course of decades and more in, annuity, in annuities. Scott considered this colossal appropriation an act of kindness bestowed on indigenous peoples as the province relieved the burden of Indian title. It was a relief, of course, that capitalist development of Canada would have been inconceivable without. Now, 1790 to 1890, Capitals, capitalism's consolidation, colonialism's constrictions. The century that reached from 1790 to 1890 witnessed the transformation of British North America, which had been a patchwork quilt of colonial outposts, into a confederated Canada that was a capitalist nation state. What is often lost sight of in the march from colony to nation, and the creation of a much heralded peaceable kingdom, is the extent to which this process unfolded through often bloody confrontation. Capitalist and colonial imperatives were sandwiched between moments of rebellious resistance in the 1830s in Upper and Lower Canada and the first 1869-1870 stand of Riel and his Métis followers. Both armed uprisings failed, but they were not without momentous consequences. Responsible government was born in central Canada, while ironically in the West, an attempt was made to wrest the freedoms of the capitalist marketplace from the infringements on free trade of the infant state's surrogate feudalistic monopoly, the Hudson's Bay Company. Riel and the Métis insisted on the rights of the original founders of Red River to a say in their governance. Meanwhile, land was dispersed to large monopolistic companies, apportioned to half-paid military officers, and sold to settlers. But in this process of alienation, from the outset, there was also Wakefieldian understandings of the need to create a laboring uh, class and mass that would produce the surplus on which capital would continually fatten, and that would essentially be landless, the landless settlers. The erasure of the indigenous commons proceeded from lands commodification then, and from capitalism's subsequent consolidation. This was the material foundation, often unarticulated, of Confederation's multifaceted national policy, which is traditionally understood to rest on the planks of tariff protection for Canadian industry, the building of a transcontinental railroad, the settlement of the prairies through encouragement of immigration. But none of these national policy components would have been possible without the dispossession of indigenous peoples, the privatization of what was called Indian territory, and the uses that would be made of it within the profit system. Indeed, appropriation of indigenous lands was a fourth unstated plank in the national policy, solidified in the numbered treaties of the late 19th century. On Alberta's Cypress uh, Hills Reserve, Poundmaker, for instance, appreciated what the coming of the Iron Horse, a symbol and substance of capital's transformation, meant to his people. He declared on New Year's Day, 1882, next summer, or latest by next fall, the railway will be close to us. The whites will fill our country, and they will dictate to us as they please. If the railways, in James, da ja James Dashuk's words, were a fatal disease vector, sector, vector pardon me, for the First Nations of the Canadian prairies, capitalism and capitalists found them a bottomless pit of bounty, one measure of which was a state gift of $62 million and 25 million acres of land, detailed in Gustavus Meyer's muckraking 1914 publication, A History of Canadian Wealth. Railways engendered class conflict. Jesse Edger Milton, commenting on Toronto's depression decade of the 1850s in a multi-volume history of the city published in 1923, noted tersely, much disorder was caused by railroad construction laborers between 1852 and 1860. This brief acknowledgement underscored the extent to which urbanization, industrialization, 
a transportation revolution, and the rise of a bureaucratized institutional state composed of houses of industry, prisons, asylums, police forces, schools, an emerging law of labor, and other disciplinary agencies were all central cornerstones in the consolidation of a capitalist Canada confronting the threat of class disorders. As further mobilizations of workers and campaigns for labor reform rocked the Canadian political economy in the 1870s and most decidedly in the 1880s, the state responded with a royal commission charged with investigating the relations of labor and capital. This was paralleled by colonization's increasingly tightened constrictions. The War of 1812, for instance, might be considered the last Indian War, a conflict between colonizing entities, British North America, and the nation United States, in which indigenous warriors were necessary and valued allies in the clash of empires. By the time of the rebellions of 1837-38, however, British colonial authorities and the upper and lower Canadian loyalists, as well as the insurgent forces of Mackenzie and Papineau, were all reluctant to enlist First Nations in their ranks. In 25 brief years, indigenous warriors went from being necessary and valued components in armed conflicts to objects of contemptu contemptuous malignment, the cause of nothing less than un grand plur, of supposed horrid barber barbarities of scalping and burning, should indigenous people be involved in the conflicts of larger, more powerful uh, empires. Reciprocities, however unequal, were no longer required at all. Legislation such as the Gradual Civilization Act of 1857, the Indian Act of 1876, as well, of course, as the British North America Act of 1867, sanctifying confederation, all made this clear. The 1857 enactment set out the terms on which a century and more of state policy towards indigenous peoples would rest. It proclaimed the desirability of removing all legal distinctions between indigenous peoples and Her Majesty's other Canadian subjects, insisting that the deserving path to Aboriginal citizenship ran through the individual acquisition of property and the renunciation of Indian status and identity. A key plank in the rising industrial and institutional state became the residential school. Conceived in the lead up to Confederation and consolidated and first implemented in its aftermath. In many ways, residential schools provided a late 19th century extension of the doctrine of terra nullius. If the original imperial project of colonization rested on the ideological assertion that indigenous peoples lack capacities to claim land because they failed to develop it. The institution of the residential school was premised on the belief that children of Aboriginal descent were incapable of properly conditioning uh, their bodies to be of service to, to capital and cultivating their minds to the same end, especially, of course, if they retained any connection to traditional ways of life. As sentient beings, then, indigenous youth uh, were denied their own evolution. Like the land long occupied by their ancestors, they were rationalized as simply there for the taking and the changing. Hair was to be cut, languages were to be suppressed, thoughts were to be reconstituted, names were to be denied, bodies were to be used. For John A. MacDonald, this was about, quote, acquiring habits and modes of thought of white men, a colonial project to be sure, but also an eminently capitalist one. Now, at the time of Confederation in 1867, only 125,000, pardon me, only 125,000 First Nations people remained in the landmass known as Canada, as well as roughly 10,000 Métis concentrated in Manitoba's Red River settlements and other western uh, outposts, and perhaps a few thousand Inuit in the Arctic. This was less than the population of Canada's leading industrial city of the late 19th century, Montreal, whose 200,000 people were a mix that included French Canadians, Irish laborers descended from the famine immigrants, Scottish merchants with fur trade pasts, Anglo-Americans 
and a smattering of blacks, the descendants of slaves, and of those free, fleeing uh, the American South's chattel slavery. To the West, Vancouver remained a city of less than 20,000, but industrial capital reached then into the Pacific Northwest coastlines and rich timber stands. The enticements of gold had drawn tens of thousands of migrants in a rush for spoils in the 1850s, but it was salmon canneries, railroad construction, timbering, and mining that proved more lasting, lasting and transformational enterprises. They entangled British Columbia's First Nations in the increasingly complex web of transoceanic uh, capital accumulation and wage labor. Unlike older colonies such as Upper and Lower Canada or those of the Atlantic coast, British Columbia as late as the 1870s had roughly equal numbers of indigenous peoples and newcomers. Uh, colonialization's dispossession and capitalism's consolidation and, and the proletarianization of workforces needed occurred not as distinct and separate phases of historical development as they had uh, in central Canada and to the east, but as aligned moments of socioeconomic transformation. In such circumstances, British Columbia's capitalist labor market in the late 19th century was unfathomable without uh, the waged work of indigenous peoples. Now, none of this happened without conflict. Prime Minister John A. Macdonald wrote in the mid-1880s to a future Minister of Finance and Receiver General and a Provincial Premier, Charles Tupper, that the governing Conservatives were not in a flourishing state. He cited Riel, the Knights of Labour, Home Rule and the Scott Act as serious challenges. If the emerging class conflict harbored socialist intellectuals and critics of capitalism fomenting strikes and mobilizing political campaigns in ways unprecedented over the course of the previous century, the Métis-led War of Resistance in the Canadian West in 1885 challenged colonialism directly. Now there were suggestive links between the two oppositional currents of class struggle in the mid-1880s and of Métis uh, uh, resistance at that exact, at that exact same moment. But the, act, the activities of those who tried to bring these developments together, and this is central to my argument, were fragmentary and fleeting. The simultaneous sidetracking and defeat of workers and indigenous Métis rebels indicated a fundamental divide. Workers were drawn into the accommodations of the state, left internally divided amid splits uh, and differentiated strategic directions, and quieted by economic depression in the 1890s. Riel and his army of redressers, forced onto their insurrectionary stand, were militarily vanquished. Their retreat mandated by the superior forces and technologies at the disposal of the capitalist state, which had come a long way in enhancing its power since 1869, 1870, and the first Riel uprising. A class mobilization struggling to find its anti-capitalist voice and an anti-colonial uprising, unsure of how to confront the consolidating state, both went down to what might be considered defeats. The difficulty we have a century and a half later in grasping what was missed in this road of common struggle not taken is, I would argue, itself a reflection of what was repressed and lost in the promise, the possibility, and the passing of 1885-1886. Now this brings me to 1890 to 1960. Capitalism ascendant, colonialism extended, resistance restrained. In many ways, the 1890 to 1960 years accelerated and intensified processes underway in the century preceding them, both respect, with respect to capitalism's development and with colonialism's alignment with it. Especially in the Canadian North, inhabited by Inuit peoples, the forced relocations recounted in Farley Moats, the people of the deer and the desperate people text of the 1950s, made it all too apparent that the heavy hand of bureaucratic authority still exercised a devastating impact on indigenous peoples. The over-incarceration of indigenous men and women, boys and girls, in prisons and reformatories 
was a product of the decades reaching from 1950 to 1970, an indication of colonialism's ongoing repression. Between 1950 and 2000, 46 federal prisons were built, compared to the only 13 such institutions constructed in the entire 115-year previous period, from 1835 to 1950. And they were destined to house disproportionately large inmate populations of indigenous peoples. Meanwhile, on capital's side, merger movements concentrated capital. Roughly 550 industrial consolidations absorbed 1,250 enterprises in the years 1900 to 1940 alone, leading to the formation of a number of highly capitalized industrial giants. O.D. Skelton, writing as the, uh, as the first pre-World War I merger uh, movement gained momentum, referred to the consolidation of capital as an epidemic accompanied by a series of evils, the most egregious of which was the overcapitalization that spawned inordinate profits of promoters uh, and vendors. By the end of the 1890 to 1960 years, the process of capitalist consolidation had been quickened and intensified by two world wars, a Great Depression, and periodic crises of overproduction that further weeded out the economically marginal and led to the emergence by the 1950s of massive financial and industrial trusts, indicative of the trend towards monopoly. The E.P. Taylor-led Argus Group, for instance, controlled 10 of Canada's dominant corporations identified by John Porter in the mid-1950s. Its pulp and paper industry interests in Eastern Canada alone constituted assets approaching 175 million by 1958, holdings that linked the Taylor uh, octopus like group to both the Royal Bank and the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Other powerhouses of uh, the Canadian uh, capitalist economy, like the Brazilian Light and Power Traction Company, that came to dominate public utilities in a number of Latin American colonies, basically revealed capitalism's, and Canadian capitalism's in particular, capacity to colonize distant markets. As capital consolidated, labor mobilized. The 1890 to 1960 period commenced with mass struggles of mill workers in the Ottawa Hull companies run by lumber barons like Perley and Patti, Booth and Bronson, and exploded in the post-World War I rash of general strikes reaching from Amherst, uh, Nova Scotia, to Victoria, British Columbia. The high point of which, of course, was the Winnipeg General Strike that required federal intervention countless arrests and deportations of strike leaders and activists, repressive state trials, and ended with the momentous battle uh, this period of miners in Kirkland Lake, asbestos in Sudbury, of steel workers in Hamilton and Murderville, of auto workers in Windsor, of loggers in British Columbia and Newfoundland, and of many others in the 1940s and 50s. In all of these struggles, organized elements were active. The Knights of Labour, the Socialist Party of Canada, the Communist Party, and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation all had a hand in these class battles, and the federal straight, long headed by William Lyon Mackenzie King, a trained authority in the pacification of such industrial conflict, initiated a spate of legislation to placate unions at the same time as it edged them in. Enactments like the Industrial Disputes Investigation Act in 1907 and the Industrial Relations and Disputes uh, Investigation Act of 1948 drew on understandings of property as well as liberal appreciations of the need not to apply to workers too much of the proverbial stick of repression. But it was always there at hand. Class struggle threatening in the 1890-1960 years was recognized and accommodated somewhat but it was also relentlessly contained, just as the revolutionary left was routinely routed whenever capital and the state felt the need. Among indigenous peoples, these were years of organization as longshoremen such as Joseph Capilano and Andrew Paul aligned with the industrial workers of the world uh, on West Coast waterfronts. Uh, they also politically led the British Columbia First Nations struggle to turn back the appropriation of land. 
traveling to London to lay before the king the grievances of a still sizable provincial indigenous population of 80,000. The West Coast indeed would prove the cradle of pan-Indian mobilizations, and in 1916, Paul founded the Indian tribes of British Columbia. King off the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the contribution of First Nations soldiers to the war effort of 1914 to 1918, and the labor militancy of 1919. A Mohawk uh, from the Six Nations Reserve near Brantford, Fred Loft, built the League of the Indians of Canada into a widening protest over land that angered Dem Duncan Campbell Scott and the Department of Indian Affairs. Scott did his best to besmirch Loft and thwart organiz organizers like Paul. In 1927, the Indian Act was revised to prohibit any solicitation of funds directed at the recovery of any claim for the benefit of any Indian tribe or band. For those kind of actions to take place, the express consent of the Department of Indian Affairs and its Indian agents was now required. So colonialism, as capitalism was consolidating, went into overdrive. Its repressive apparatus entrenching dispossession. Within the capitalist labor market, a parallel of this was that it became more and more difficult, even in places with long traditions of First Nations waged work, for indigenous peoples to retain their wage earning jobs, a trajectory of truncated economic possibility, which has been noted by people like Rolf Knight and John Lutz, uh, in British Columbia, and from Manitoba by Jim Morochik and Frank Tuff. In the residential schools, as George Manuel later recalled, every Indian smelled of hunger. Indigenous political opposition, once again, remained largely apart from the left-wing, working class, and social democratic campaigns animating many, many Canadians in the World War I era of labor revolt and in the campaigns of the 1930s and 1940s. Two Métis radicals, Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris, for instance, drew on the growing resentment and tensions uh, among the destitute, non-reserved indigenous peoples of Alberta and Saskatchewan in the Great Depression. They struggled within both the Communist Party and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF, within the, which they both worked, to, to raise the level of political awareness of First Nations and Métis uh, um, issues with their Marxist and socialist comrades. It was tough political sledding. Within the mainstream political culture, a joint Senate and House of Commons committee held hearings from 1946 to 1948 and provided draft revisions to the foundational legislative document of 19th century colonialism, the Indian Act. Little in the end changed. When the narrow amendments were debated in the House of Commons, even John Diefenbaker, leader of the Conservative Party, rose to proclaim, the mountain brings forth a mouse. Chief Joe Drever of the Mistalsis Band and leader of the Associated Indians of, of Saskatchewan expressed his disappointment. It, it appears my people are to, are to remain manacled to and governed by bureaucracy, he noted. Should the government decide to retain the smothering protective laws that have kept us down for so long, then the future is dark without a glimmer of the expected dawn. So as we end this period, long period of capitalist consolidation and colonial uh, constriction, uh, from 1890 to 1960, colonialism and capitalism seemed set for a further long and a lucrative run. And then the 1960s happened. 1960 to 2022, we'll call this section anti-capitalism and anti-colonialism uh, and capitalist and capitalist crisis. The economic promise of endless possibility associated with the 1960s proved to be ascendant capitalism's last Canadian gasp. Resistance surged from many quarters. Within the labor movement, youthful hotheads were in no mood to bend the knee of supplication before an arbitrary uh, workplace governance practice and conventional labor capital relations. Authority at every level from the foreman uh, to the legal system to state decrees they regarded with disdain. 
A wave of illegal wildcat strikes erupted in the mid-60s, challenging capital of the state and ossified union bureaucracies. Radical students fed up with Cold War conventions, protested the nuclear arms race, demanded civil rights for oppressed minorities, marched against imperialist aggression and colonialism abroad, and called for an end to the war in Vietnam. The, the state bankrolled the Company of Young Canadians, the CYC, in an attempt to co-opt youth radicalism. This simply whet the appetite for social activism and transformation. The CYC soon harbored militants, putting out newspapers called Workers' Power, supporting indigenous activists resisting colonization, and aligning with a rising movement of revolutionary nationalism in Quebec. With each passing year from 1963 to 1969, the Quebecois mounted more and more protests, many of them violent. A veteran of the CYC, Jeanette Corbier Laval, of, Manitoulin, of a Manitoulin Island First Nation, would lead the 1973 court challenge to the Indian Act and its sexual discrimination against women who married non Indigenous men. Other Indigenous CYCers helped create autonomous First Nations, Metis, and Inuit organizations, such as the Northwest Territories Indian Brotherhood and they worked with white supporters and radicals to pioneer the National Film Board's All Indian Crew. They founded the Indian Traveling College. Black Power in the United States provided a forum for indigenous militants to develop red power, ripping off, riffing off the increasingly dissident rhythms of mobilizations in the U.S. associated with the Black Panthers and other black nationalist organizations. The 1960s, for perhaps the first time in Canadian history, offered the possibility, I say simply that, the possibility of the fusion of anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist mobilization and protest. As mercurially and, unfleet, and ultimately fleeting as was this moment, it was nonetheless a watershed in the history of Canadian capitalism, colonialism, and the protest fused against them. But 1960s possibilities succumbed to capitalism's post-1973 crises. By the 1990s, the rise of an austerity-driven, state-embraced neoliberalism, the consequent erosion of the labor movement's numbers and strength, the decline of the new left, and the overall shifting of the political spectrum to the right numbed the anti-capitalist sensibilities of 1960s struggle. All of this conditioned many a personal retreat as radical organizations were eviscerated. What remained, however, of the 1960s, along with, and I, I haven't talked at all about this, but along with, I think, a, a, an affinity for women's liberation and feminist politics, what remained of the 1960s was a lasting legacy of anti-colonialism that would constantly refer back to the politics of red power associated with the wider mobilizations of what has come to be referred to as 1968. A late 1960s liberal government of Pierre Trudeau took one last patently transparent lapse along the route, and very tired one, of overt uh, coerced assimilation. Trudeau, Critchin, and others suggested in 1969 that they would revoke the Indian Act and quote, free indigenous peoples to become citizens like any others. This move backfired. Those offered this freedom wanted no part of the state's truly Faustian bargain, understanding that relinquishing their special status, however much it was itself dripping with oppressive conditions and restrictions on their liberties, was not worth what was on offer. Indigenous politics in the 1960s entered a new phase. It took a quantitative leap forward, as well as a qualitative one. Many more political organizations of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples were formed in the years 1960 to 1973, a total of 86 in all in those years, than in the entire period from the late 18th century to 1959, hundreds of years in which 61 organizations had been formed. Even more important, however, than this explosion quantitatively of indigenous organization. 
was the changing nature of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit agency. Their reduction to the status of wards of the state, their alienating uh, relegation to cul-de-sacs of impoverished dispossession and isolation, was now subject to powerful critique as rebellious indigenous youth became part of a more generalized radicalization with which they identified. Dene militants in the Canadian North, opposed to the construction of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, linked the colonialism of the residential school system, the capitalist encroachment on their lands, and the denigration of alternative ways of living that both indigenous peoples and new, new, and new left youth were embracing. When a 40-year-old social democratic lawyer and British Columbia Supreme Court justice and a former leader of the New Democratic Party New Democratic Party of New Left Sensibilities, Thomas Berger, was by something of a political fluke appointed to oversee a 1974 to 1977 inquiry into pipeline construction uh, in the Canadian North. The confluence of 1960s radicalism, red power, and indigenous mobilization came together in a stand both anti-capitalist and anti-colonial. As the Berger inquiry was happening, Capitalism was actually spiraling downward in a global crisis that turned on the very resources, oil and natural gas, that had prompted the hearings galvanizing northern indigenous peoples. Capitalism's first sustained post-World War II crisis exposed, exposed the, the sort of Achilles heel of the profit system, its falling rate of accumulation. By the calculations of the sociologist Murray Smith, the rate of profit for Canadian capital in the years 1971 to 1975 reached lows never experienced in the post-World War II period. The state lived with a cash flow problem. Revenues dried up. From a balance of almost three billion to the good in 1973, Ottawa confronted large deficits in 1975 and again in 1976. The ideology of Keynesianism in which government spending was extolled and welfare and other state programs of amelioration extended had run its course. A fiscal crisis of the state was unfolding amidst the real politic of a profitability crunch. As capital lurched from crisis to crisis in subsequent years, weathering stagflation, and wage and price control uh, impositions in the 1970s and 80s, international currency collapses in the 1990s, a 2007 to 2009 meltdown induced in part by reckless mortgage policies, especially in the United States, and a 2019, 2023 seemingly never ending pandemic. Capital rebounded from the profitability crisis of the 1970s but managed to keep labor under its increasingly powerful and state-supported thumb. Annual strike levels plummeted. The percentage of working time lost to strikes fell almost continuously in these later, 19, later 20th and early 21st century years. Uh, by the late 1980s, strike levels stood at approximately one-third of that of the mid-1970s. In the early 1990s, this was less than one-fifth. As the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis crippled workplaces with 450,000 full-time Canadian workers laid off, the unemployment count ratcheted up to 1.5 million. Ontario's critical manufacturing sector shed 176,000 jobs. Strike activity was brought to an absolute halt in the 2007 to 2009 crisis as it did again falter during the COVID-19 induced crisis a decade later. If workers lost out, capital did rather well. Bailed out in 2007, 2009, Canadian banks turned the subsequent pandemic crisis into a financial boondoggle. Their profits climbed astronomically. On the windfall strength of over 57 billion in profits accumulated during the COVID crisis, uh, Canadian, Canada's leading financial institutions instituted uh, procedures to pay out $19 billion in bonuses to their corporate leaders. Crisis was clearly good for some. Others, not so much. 
Almost 70% of Canadians thought that whatever the government was saying and the media proclaiming, they were caught in the vice grip of recession in February 2022. One quarter of the country's people confronted insolvency and nearly one half reported that they were but $200 away from being able to cover their monthly expenses. Now among Indigenous peoples who felt the blows of this process of capitalist consolidation in workplaces and in the state's neoliberal pension for cutbacks and austerity, the repressive attack was somewhat different. Whereas organized labor and militant workers were perceived as being offered more in the way of state conciliation in the era of the post-war settlement, reaching from 1946 to 1973, Indigenous peoples in these years had remained an object to be coercively assimilated, at least for much of that period. After 1973, things changed, at least in terms of the rhetoric of the state and public proclamations. It became commonplace to denounce workers and their organizations, just as it was increasingly seen as prudent in the corridors of state power and even in the boardrooms of more astute corporations, to acknowledge, at least rhetorically, that Indigenous consultation and recognition were necessary. This subtle seeming shift, of course, did very little to actually alter the material relations of either workers or indigenous peoples to substantive colonial and capitalist power. But the softer indigenous touch on the part of the colonial state and the capitalist interest it championed was routinely accompanied behind the scenes by an often intransi intransigent negotiating stand on land a failure to implement concrete actions addressing issues as pressing as over-incarceration or even potable water on reserves, and, it, and an ineptitude in moving decisively to thwart the violence which, is, which was taking many lives within Indigenous communities, especially with respect to murdered and missing Aboriginal girls and women. The state in particular sustained a certain continuity of centuries-old practices of dividing First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, the better to keep them subordinate. Colonization's secure hold over indigenous peoples was increasingly dependent on what the red power advocates of the 1960s had rejected, acquiescence to capital and integration into the ultimately hegemonic hold of the Canadian state's policies of negotiating consent. consent. Lee Maracle, for instance, insists that as early as 1972, Red Power's militant tactics had been usurped by the growing presence of government-funded organizations. Fewer people came out to demonstrations organized by Red Power militants. They began to look, she said, like fringe fanatics. In the brief years separating 1968 and the early to mid-1970s then, a reversal had actually begun to take place. Conservatism within recognized indigenous bands and their accommodated leaderships grew more and more entrenched over years of moderate brokering with the state, some of which appeared, admittedly, to result in gains in the courts and elsewhere. Between 1973 and 2021, dozens of legal decisions and federal and provincial concessions addressed significant land claims and other indigenous entitlements but all were hedged in, in the final instance, by capitalist and colonial strictures and structures. As the rhetoric of recognition morphed into a state-sponsored political facade of reconciliation, erected as a wall behind which federal and provincial governments gathered their ideological and programmatic forces of obfuscation and, at times, obstruction, indigenous peoples rallied to defenses of land and demands for restitution, redress, and relief. Revelations about in, in residential school abuses, not only psychological and physical, but sexual, surfaced with increasing regularity from the mid to late 1980s. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission was prodded into being, Prime Minister Stephen Harper issuing a 2008 apology for the sad chapter residential schools constituted in the book of Indigenous State Relations. Money was paid out. In 2021, scientific probes of land near a Kamloops residential school established that as many as 200 unmarked 
and undocumented graves might well be present. And over the course of the next year, many other residential schools were reported to contain such burials. As announcements of these unrecognized graveyards proliferated in the summer of 2021, 68 churches on or near reserves or former residential schools were vandalized, some burned to the ground. All of this captured the attention of Canadians and galvanized support for the rhetoric of reconciliation. But Indigenous girls and women continued to be murdered or go missing. Land defenders from Oka, Quebec to Ipperwash, Ontario to Lake Gustafsson in northern British Columbia, as well as water protectors in New Brunswick seized disputed lands and territories and confronted provincial police forces and Royal, Cali Royal Canadian Mounted Police in armed standoffs, some of them leading to deaths. Blockades, occupations, protests, and other confrontations continued into the 21st century and included at least a dozen major extra-legal protests and clashes. Militancy of this kind stood in stark contrast to the more conventional and state-recognized leadership of the Assembly of First Nations, which opted for more state symbolic marches, appeals to Parliament, and sit-downs with government officials. AFN leaders were said to actually have cooperated with the RCMP in monitoring an outbreak of direct action Indigenous protest in 2007. Indig indigenous peoples had sufficient light left in, the, left in them to launch Idle No More in 2012, a mobilization that, like the rejection of the state's white paper in 1969, was born of a refusal to accept a federal government piece of legislation, the Jobs and Growth Act. This bill, an invasive reconstruction of 60 previously passed pieces of legislation, threatened to undermine treaty rights ensconced in the Indian Act and weaken significantly a number of environmental laws um, uh, that curbed the twin capitalist and colonial for-profit exploitation of land, resources, and waterways. Mushrooming throughout Canada, and indeed the world, Idle No More proclaimed, as had read power in the 1960s, that a pan-Indian movement of resistance could indeed step outside the boundaries of indigenous state relations, what Glenn Coulthard has designated a snare of vacuous gestures of accommodation. As impressive as was the Idle No More uprising, which continues, albeit with far less fanfare than a few years ago, it alone cannot sustain the anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist policies of opposition, which are desperately needed at the current threatening conjuncture. The politics and the sensibilities of the 1960s need to be reconstituted. And this requires nothing less than a rebuilding of militant movements of labor and the left. The difficult task will not take place, of course, without due attention to the demands and needs of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. In turn, those same people will need to frontally address the concerns and struggles of their counterparts in trade unions, socialist feminist circles, and the unemployed, anti-poverty, and other progressive, potentially anti-capitalist and anti-colonial social movements in which indigenous communities are both involved and inevitably interested. Without a revisioning of the revolutionary purpose that has historically surfaced, however rarely, in indigenous and non-indigenous alliance around intransigent opposition to the inseparably entwined structures of capitalist and colonial subordination. The opponents of these systems of debasement will remain divided and consequently enfeebled in their resistance. Limited in the transformational, uh, transformative possibilities, they must together bring into being. If centuries of history from 1500 to the present indicate how daunting is the task before those who recognize the dire necessity of this fused anti-capitalist, anti-colonial politics, the current moment, surely, is one that cries out for the realization of what, is, what has so often and so sadly seemed unattainable. Thank you very much.
exactly 50 minutes legal time. Uh, let's hang, I, I should really encourage people to hang around. It would be wonderful to uh, see a lot of you and people to, 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 to mix foods here, get a drink, hang and around. Really thanks for coming. This is just a, a, a wonderful way to uh, launch this school. Uh, so thanks. Thanks enormously.